Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live, and uh, we're about to embark on a prophecy journey like never before concerning the house of Israel. And right now I'm open to Ezekiel uh, chapter 37, verse 14 to 16. And I mentioned to you a little while back, this is a fulfilled passage. But yet I have discovered there is an unfulfilled passage about the house of Israel that has not been fulfilled as of yet. That's the journey we're about to go down today, and it's one that is a shocker to me, and I'm sure will be a shocker to you. Before we get into that, though, let me just quickly mention, and I don't know the outcome as of yet right now, but uh, the president of Iran, he met with the Azerbaijan president, uh, Ahim Aliaz, uh, and uh, uh, of course it was uh, Ibrahim Rassi that met with him, the president of Iran. And after meeting with him, his, his helicopter crashed mysteriously. Uh, it is a possibility that he could be alive. At least early reports are saying that by the time this airs, he may, may already know the answer to that. But I have a feeling that Israel was sending a message to Azerbaijan's president, uh, Mr. Aliyev, mainly because Israel works with Azerbaijan and they would use Azerbaijan to attack Iran in the near future when they're ready to take down Iran. So I thought that was kind of an interesting uh, note there. That's just a little side note on the news there. Let's go back into this. So here, Ezekiel, right? If we remember Ezekiel 37, in verse 3 he says, And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. We know the, the thing of the, the valley full of dry bones. At the very beginning of the chapter here, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and the Lord carried me out in the spirit and set me down the midst of a val of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones can can these bones live? And of course he answers God, he says, You know. I don't know, but you know, right? Ben Adam. He calls him son of man. I want to just kind of keep that thought in mind too, where he calls him Ben Adam. All right, just hold on to that thought. Then, of course, we come down later in the prophecy, verse 11. Then, then he said unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are clean cut off. Because if you remember, the house of Israel went into exile long before the house of Judah went into exile. And the house of Israel really felt like there is no hope for them to ever come back. But yet Ezekiel prophesies that they would come back. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves, cause you to come up out of your graves, and into the land of Israel. Now, the only time in history where we have had that actually happening is in the book of Matthew, chapter 28, when we read about that many of those who slept when Jesus rose from the grave, they arose from the dead and they were seen mingling among those that were living. Yeah, what do you know? And we know according to the book of Acts, right? Let me just quickly, I've gone through this before, uh, but just as a reminder, you know, and, and looking at this as, as a scripture that is fulfilled, I've got some kind of virus of putting all kinds of nonsense advertisements in my computer now. But in any way, right there, we know here that when we get down, this is on the day of Pentecost, we know that the house of Judah has received the Holy Spirit. They come out, they're speaking with other tongues, uh, you know. And then we find that when Peter addresses the crowd, he says in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So the house of Israel was clearly there because we find that they were Judeans, not Jews, it was Judeans. That's the Greek word used up there in the beginning of the chapter. The Judeans were there. They were gathered there from all over the earth. They, and they said, how hear we every man in our own tongue where we, wherein we are born? Now, Peter now identifies that group from all over the world as the house of Israel. And then we also find that not only do you, does he identify them as the house of Israel, but also, um, 
let me, I don't want to lose my train of thought here. Uh, but he, he identifies them as the house of Israel, fulfilling the scripture of Ezekiel, the two sticks, they are now bound together and they have believed the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember too, I remember the thought now, Jesus had constantly told his apostles when he sent them abroad, go only into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Remember that? It's what he said to them over and over and over, go into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All right, so I have argued that the house of Israel had come home. We see this in the book of Acts. We see that they are clearly this group of people from all over the world. Uh, you men of Judea and all that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known to you, hearken unto my words, for these are not drunken as you suppose. Yet this is but the third hour of the day, right? They were mocking. Where are they from? Perithians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, going all the way even into Rome and to Arabia. Okay? And they, they said, How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Verse 8 of Acts chapter 2. And like I said, Peter later identifies them as the house of Israel. Because why? The house of Judah, those 120 that were the first believers from the house of Judah were actually in the upper room. They were there. They received the Holy Spirit. Because remember the house of, what was it? Um, uh, let me, if I can remember how that scripture goes. Will not lift up foot. So let's put lift up foot, if I remember that right. Uh, oh, lift, not left. Remember the scripture, lift up, or lift their foot. Let's see. I, I forget where that scripture is at. There's a scripture where Judah's not going to lift up his heel, or maybe it's his heel, against uh, Israel, uh, or vice versa. Um, and I forget how that, I forget how it's worded now. But anyway, that prophecy had to be fulfilled that Judah would be saved first and then the house of Israel. All right, so Jesus clearly fulfilled that scripture. So you might be wondering, well, see, what do you mean then the house of Israel? There's prophecy that they have not fulfilled as of yet. There is. Okay, remember in Matthew's gospel, the 24th chapter, uh, his apostles ask him, you know, they depart the temple, and he talks about the, you know, they're showing him the temple and all the buildings, and, the, and he says to them, there won't be one stone here left upon another that will not be thrown down. Well, that kind of shocks them. So they come to him privately and they ask him, what, three things, when shall these things be? In other words, when is the temple going to be destroyed? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? That's a different one. And the end of the world. And yet another different one. So three different questions are asked. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars, rumors of war. See, you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places. Now, the kingdom against kingdom was one of the ones that I shared with you a little while back. And this message over here, kingdom against kingdom, the real meaning. Because I realized when you really begin to examine the scripture, what, who, who had, where was the kingdom to begin with and who had the kingdom? Because if you remember, they asked Jesus, when, will at this time you restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus says, not for you to know the time nor the season. But he actually talks about the Pharisees, and he said, the kingdom will be torn from you and given to a nation bringing forth fruits. So the Pharisees themselves were a kingdom of their own, not a godly kingdom. And that kingdom will rise, there's going to be a kingdom against kingdom. So the kingdom that is torn from them and is given to a nation bringing forth fruit, that ended up being the early Jewish believers, both houses, Judah and Israel, as well as what? The Gentiles that came in. 
So follow me as I do this now. And I'm going to show something to you real quick. We're going to jump to Revelation. What you're going to understand now is how that this, this fourth horse rider, the pale horse, who goes forth, his name that sat on him is death, hell followed with him. Power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, with the beast of the earth. And when he had opened the fist, I saw unto the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. Keep in mind, his seal's open. It doesn't mean that they have to be, oh, this one's going to happen. And oh, a few more years later, that one's going to happen. It could be years apart. Or they could be simultaneously as well. And the fifth seal is kind of simultaneous with the fourth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true? Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Wait a minute. How long do you not judge and avenge our blood, right? What blood is he talking about? Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte when he is made. You make him twofold more child of hell than yourselves, right? As you go down in Matthew 23, Jesus eventually says that they are blind Pharisees. He also says to them, you are serpents, you're a generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? And then he finally concludes it with verse 35, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from blood, the blood of righteous Abel and to the blood of Zacharias son of Bar Barcaeus, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Jesus indicted the Pharisees for all the blood shed on the earth. So it's no wonder that when we read in Revelation and they're saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? The Pharisees. Or that spirit that empowers the Pharisees. Notice even the animals of the earth they're going to kill with. Reptilians. Demonic entities. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren, not just servants, but brethren, so they are kindred to them, they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. Well, Jesus clearly indicted the Pharisees for the deaths and who were they killing? They killed Jesus. They killed the apostles. They killed many of the saints in the early days. And we see that Jesus indicts them going all the way back to the bloodshed of even of Abel. Interesting, isn't it? So all that bloodshed is there. They're indicted for everything that happens. Revelation says they're going to kill this way. And the souls under the altar are wanting to know when is this all going to come to an end. So, we jump back into Matthew. Now you see what kingdom against kingdom is. So the Pharisee dynasty now is this kingdom of the Pharisees is rising back up in modern days under the Orthodox Jews of Israel. And those that are in power in Israel. And they have rose up against the kingdom of believers of Jesus, the Christians, and they're waging war against them even now. And they're becoming victorious. As we see in Revelation, they're going to be victorious because the fifth seal says there's going to be more martyrs, isn't there? Well, this is where it gets interesting, right? As we see, as we go on, though, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. That's because the kingdom that has rose up against you, the Pharisees, are far more organized because underneath the fourth horse rider who is death and hell is following with him, he's got a lot of demonic power backing him up. 
Yes. And now he's causing that division to come amongst the believers. Remember what Jude said? Let's take a look at Jude. Let's jump, jump over to the book of Jude real quick, right? That's a good book just to help get your mind in, in, in remembrance, right? For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation and godly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they're doing. They're subverting the gospel of Jesus Christ to such a place and they've come in among you and you don't even realize. They're taking you back to the law, putting you underneath these rabbis as people like Shapira and many others do. Tobia Singer, no different. All these ungodly men, Pharisees of that dynasty of the kingdom that's rising up against your kingdom, which you're supposed to be the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And you're being defeated. I would there put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains on their darkness unto the judgment of the great day. He reserved them. So during that day of judgment, there's a coming out. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth in example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So now, let's go back. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. They put such a division in Christianity now. Got you believe in this doctrine, that doctrine, you know, the Schofield Zionist doctrine. And because we don't go along with the Schofield Zionist doctrine, you become the most hated person on the planet Earth. Kingdom against kingdom. And Revelation, the fifth seal. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he, but he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. This gospel. The way Jesus preached it originally. That comes under the ministry of your two witnesses. And by the way, I know there's a lot of people who always said that it's Enoch and Elijah. I understand now where you get that from. So I will concede in that. Even though we saw Moses and Elijah appear before Jesus on Mount Transfiguration, I can concede in that argument because of what I'm going to share with you. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of Daniel the prophet and stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let him which is in Judea flee into the mountains. Let flee, uh, flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the house top not come down to take anything out of his house. Now he's talking about what happened two thousand years ago with the Roman army coming in. Right. Let's move forward. Pray you, pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation, such was not since the, the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. Except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved, but the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ or there, believe it not. For there shall rise false Christ and false prophets. Again, he, he brings us up. It's like a second time he brings us up. Almost as if it's a different time period. Why does he do it differently here? He already set it up here, right? Um... And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. So the false Christ and false prophets down here is totally different than the ones up there. And shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Why? It's two different time periods. 
The one above is for the time period of the apostles and what they would deal with, the false prophets that would come along. But later, coming down further, there shall arise false Christs, false anointed ones, false messiahs, and false prophets. Now you got false Christ and false prophets. Notice the kingdom that rises up against the kingdom, the Pharisees coming back into power in the modern days we're living in today since the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948. There has been a battle against the Christians and they have been undermining Christian beliefs through Zionist theology and implanting and embedding in amongst you guys like you never would even believe. It is very sad. Very sad. Behold, I have told you before, he says. Wherefore, if you shall say, and, uh, they, excuse me, they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And I think there's a metaphor in that. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. That's not a good thing, by the way, because if you read it in the Hebrew, Matthew, so wherever the carcass is, there the buzzards are gathered. In other words, there are some that would like to present to you a dead Jesus. And oddly enough, there are writings, I think in Thomas's writing or something, that speaks about um, they will preach a dead man. That will become their savior. Modern days, Christianity. People don't really recognize the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he is a living son of God, not a dead son. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other. Now, notice, now learn a parable of the fig tree, when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. But what does he mean by the fig tree? If I prove to you that Ezekiel was fulfilled, Ezekiel 37, that both the house of Israel and the house of Judah on the day of Pentecost received the Holy Spirit, and we see that that is true, what is this fig tree then? I happen, there are three different books called the Apocalypse of Peter. There's one that was found in Egypt in Nag Hammadi. There is another in the Ethiopian scriptures. There was one found uh, back, uh, dated to the 5th century. There was uh, a Greek version of the Gospel of uh, the, the Apocalypse of Peter. Now, the one in Nakamadi that was found in Egypt and the one that is in the Ethiopic version as well as the... And there's two different versions that were found that were dated early, early on uh, that they found that confirmed the Ethiopic version. It's the, the Ethiopic version that I'm interested in here. Because at the very beginning of that particular writing there, and I have it here on the screen for you, uh, in chapter 2, but starting in chapter 1, he goes into the same thing that we read in Matthew 24. And we besought, they were on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him, and we besought and, and entreated him severally, and implored him, saying to him, Declare unto us, what are the signs of your coming, the end of the, end of, the end of the world? that we may perceive and mark the time of your coming and instruct those who come after us to whom we preach the word of your gospel and whom we install in your church that they, when they hear it, may take heed to themselves and mark the time of your coming. And the Lord answered us saying, Take heed that no man deceive you and that you be not doubters and serve other gods. 
Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. There it is. This is after their time. The future generation as they've inquired. Believe them not, neither draw near to them. For the coming of the Son of God shall not be plain, but as the lightning. Notice, the coming of the Son of God shall not be plain. But as the lightning that shines from the east to the west, so will I come upon the clouds of heaven with a great host in my majesty. That's another reason why I wonder if there's a metaphor in this. Because he said it's not plain. He's almost implying that it's a metaphor. With my cross going before my face will I come in my majesty, shining seven times brighter than the sun, will I come in my majesty with all my saints my angels, my father shall set a crown upon my head that I may judge the quick and the dead and recompense everyone according to his works. Then we get into chapter two. This is where it gets interesting. And you learn a parable from the fig tree. Just like we got in Matthew 24. As soon as its shoots have come forth and the twigs grown, the end of the world shall come. And I, Peter, answered and said to him, Interpret the fig tree to me. How can we understand it? For throughout all its days, the fig tree sends forth shoots, and every year it brings forth its fruit for its master. What then does the parable of the fig tree mean? We do not know. And the master answered and said to me, Do you not understand that the fig tree is the house of Israel? It is like a man who planted a fig tree in his garden and it brought forth no fruit. Remember, that's another parable he gives in the Gospels too. And he sought the fruit many years and when he did not find it, he said to the keeper of his garden, uproot this fig tree so that it does not make our ground unfruitful. Wow. And the gardener said to his master, let us rid it of the weeds and dig the ground round about it and water it if then it does not bear fruit, we will straightway uproot it from the garden and plant another in place of it. Have you not understood that the fig tree is the house of Israel? Verily I say to you, when its twigs have sprouted forth in the last days. See, they already came back when Jesus preached the gospel and a remnant, though the house of Israel be as the sand of the seed, yet a remnant would return. That was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. But now, in this parable, the twigs have sprouted forth in the last days, then shall false Christ come and awake expectation. False anointed ones, saying, I am the Christ who has now come into the world. And that's exactly what the Pharisees are doing today this dynasty that is trying to, that is raising up kingdom against kingdom. They're coming against the Christian believers and they're battling hard against the believers and the believers are succumbing to the battle. They're defeating you because they know the word of God better than most Christians do. That's why I told you a singer can sway so many of you. And now they on this huge mission that Jesus was no more than just another Jewish prophet amongst their own. They won't totally throw him out. Notice what he says here, though. They'll say, I am Christ, who has now come into the world. And when they perceive the wickedness of their deeds, they shall turn away and deny him whom our fathers praised. And the first Christ whom they crucified, and therein sinned a great sin. That's the believers that succumb to it. And they're succumbing like in droves. But this deceiver is not the Christ. And when they reject him, that's a different group that reject him. That's the house of Israel. That's that little fig tree that's putting forth its buds that are waking up. When they reject him, he shall slay them with the sword. And there shall be many martyrs. Then shall the twigs of the fig tree, that is the house of Israel, 
shoot forth. Many shall become martyrs at his hand. Enoch and Elijah shall be sent to teach them that this is the deceiver who must come into the world and do signs and wonders in order to deceive. And therefore those who die by his hand shall be martyrs and shall be reckoned among the good and righteous martyrs who have pleased God in their life. Now, look at Revelation's fifth seal. Right? And I saw unto the altar souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? They've already died. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. Fellow servants are those that were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ here in the last days. It stood for the truth. But their brethren is the house of Israel that had also recognized that Jesus Christ truly is the Messiah here in the last days. And to them, I always said Moses and Elijah, And this may be the very correct way in, it may be Enoch and Elijah. As we read in the book of the Apocalypse of Peter that is part of the um, Ethiopic Bible. So there still is more prophecy of the house of Israel to be fulfilled. And it's because of what Jesus said about the fig tree. You know, I can't help but wonder. Because you've got to remember, not all the house of Israel was able to come home back then. Only a remnant, as the scripture said, a remnant would return. And in Acts chapter 2, it's only a small remnant. But the house of Israel is given one more opportunity. One more. And I can't help but wonder, like Venezuela's president, when he stood up, against what Israel is doing. And yet people like uh, Rabbi Shapira, the Messianic rabbi, Yitzhak Shapira, who go out there into South America saying, you are the house of Israel. You are the, the Sephardi, or the, the, excuse me, the, uh, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the Sephardim. And your fathers rejected uh the Torah and accepted Jesus Christ through the Catholic Church and he tells him you must repent, repent, repent. Listen to me. When you reject Jesus Christ, you're losing the battle against the kingdom, rising against kingdom. You should be trying to win the Pharisees to Jesus Christ because there are still some Nicodemuses, I do believe, that are part of the Pharisaic dynasty. Not all, everybody that's Pharisee is a bad guy. getting into the battle and losing to them and undermining, crucifying your Lord Jesus afresh because you do not believe any longer the truth of the gospel? That's a shame. Friends, listen. I pray for you. God, have mercy and wake us up. Uh, I am trying to get, by the way, I'm trying to get some friends to help transcribe uh, I think one person wrote me, though, that it's like a paid service to do it. I don't have the ability right now, unless it would be very inexpensive to pay to have someone to transcribe. But we do need to get some of the works that I'm doing transcribed because I'm wanting to put this together in a book form. And in the book form, I'm able to go deeper into these things. But I'm transcribing some of these messages I'm putting out so that I can add it. I've already got over 100 pages written in the book. What did rabbis miss? I feel desperately that this is important not only for them but for believers as well to recognize where we are in prophecy. I'm Stephen Benoon. Thank you for your support. Thank you for the support of this ministry. Um, you, can, you can go right there online to our website, israelinewslive.org. Um, you, could, you could jump on there and you can write there. You can donate online. That would greatly be appreciated or by mail. Stephen Ben Noon, P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872. We thank you for your love and support. 
Uh, even if you if, if you join up with LifeWave, you know that helps support our work as well. Uh, but on that in that case, you're helping yourself tremendously. You're helping yourself. Um, God bless you. Thank you, and thank you for listening.